So now, <laughs> let's talk about Kenya's debt situation and the options that the government has right now to address all these issues that we are talking about. And also just looking at the state of the economy so far. We are joined by an economist from the IG Group. His name is Churchill Ogutu. Good morning, Churchill. Morning, Eric. Very good to have you on the show. Karibu sana to the hot seat of the situation room. Shukran. Hey, now you're, you're shut even now, you're topical. Huh? <laughs> Katops. <laughs> Today, hey, when Jiro came looking like that, <laughs> then here is Churchill looking like that. <laughs> when Jiro is going to give Ndu the contacts to her tailor, Churchill is going to give Eric <laughs> contact to his tailor. <laughs> Na mambo yana namna hiyo. Yes. Development. Yeah. Ama namna gani? Yes. Si tuko Yes. Mm. welcome. Thank you. The day's proverb by City Muga. Yes, from the country of Côte d'Ivoire. Mm. Two flavors confuses the palate. Two flavors confuses the palate. Yes. Churchill, you're thinking deep and hard. <laughs> All right. What do you think the Ivorians were saying? Uh -huh. What's your interpretation of that proverb? Hmm. Mm. Interesting. Mm. I think it's similar to how they say that too many cooks spoil the brute. Mm -hmm. mm. I think so. So my understanding is that if you have so many competing ideas, it just you never identify yeah something like that hmm. yeah. what's happening hmm. too many things uh, you don't know what is really. or maybe there's a case to be made for multiple tastes and your taste shouldn't just be singular hmm. confusion isn't necessarily a bad thing you could also take a social approach mm -hmm. polygamous no, no. Very, very many. Is that the text you are speaking of? by a woman. <laughs> uh, association of, of past wives. Mm. <laughs> Polygamy Polyg is not a factor of the past in this yeah. country. Yes. It's present continuous. It's present continuous. <laughs> yes. Yes. So the association of past wives got mm. together. Mm. And and they they said, no, 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 no. Too many. <laughs> mm. Mixing things yeah. up. They spoil yeah. the flavor. <laughs> They call the goat wives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Churchill. Yes. Uh, let's begin. When we're looking at the headline of the Business Daily today, we we're like, okay. So we see what it's saying. It's saying that uh, the dollar market is beginning to stabilize, following some steps that have been taken in the last couple of weeks. What is it that you hear, and what is it that you see? Uh, thanks, Eric. So let me start with how it was. I think the last two or three years. Essentially, we have an interbank market, and that is what we also see within the context of uh, the current, uh, in any given day, banks, some banks are short of liquidity, other banks have liquidity. So with an interbank market, those banks which are short of liquidity go approaches the banks with higher uh, surplus of liquidity, and then they are able now to balance their liquidity needs. But when you get into the foreign exchange interbank market, that is essentially what needs to happen. Mm. There are banks which have uh, dollar demands, uh, or they have their dollars in their books, are not able to match the dollar demands from their clients. Mm. So within the context of an uh, foreign exchange interbank market, at least they are able now to engage other banks which have surplus dollars and then at least we can now be able to see a convergence of uh, FX rates. Mm. And because that interbank market uh, broke for a number of years, what happened is now banks were able, were now pricing their dollars according to at any at whimsic, whimsical whim. yeah at their whims yeah and that now led to a big divergence between the banks what they are charging clients on dollars mm. and what the official uh, dollar rate was by the central bank of kenya but at least if we have seen uh, this fx interbank market starting to operate at least there's a bit of some convergence because all the banks are now able to see the pricing between all the banks and in a way uh, they could lead now to that divergence between what the banks are charging and also where the official uh, CBK rate is. So right now initially mm. the spread, now the difference between what the banks were charging their clients 
and where the CBK official rate was, that spread was 13 shillings. Right now it has narrowed to 6 uh, shillings. So at least that's a fair assessment that the FX interbank market has started to operate. What had made it collapse or stop operating? From what we hear is that, uh, first of for, foremost, I mean, banks were not able to, they didn't have that visibility. Uh, so I think... Uh, Please. What do you mean they didn't have visibility? Okay. No, so, <laughs> uh, they, they, <laughs> so Bank A did not know the dollar demands or dollar supply of Bank B and all the other banks. So that's what I mean by visibility. Stop, yes. Should they? What is it, yes, what is it that allows visibility? to be there if there is an fx interbank market so if okay. you're so what is an fx uh, interbank market that is what i was explaining in the mm. sense that uh i started with the context of uh, liquidity needs in any given day by banks so if at the end of the day you know banks are required to have certain levels of uh, liquidity in the sense that if they are holding x amount of deposits a certain percentage of that needs to be in liquid assets so for in the context that banks are not able at the end, end of any given day their liquid assets are either lower than what is required mm. they are uh, supposed now to go to other banks at least which have surplus liquidity and then they can be able to borrow from those banks so that's the same context that happens within the interbank fx market mm. uh, where so why had it collapsed it collapsed in the sense that uh, uh from what we gather from market operators this is the banks uh i think uh, from i think there's a disconnect somewhere uh, in the sense that uh, the Apex Bank, this is the central bank, uh, was not able now to coordinate all the banks together, at least such that they are able now to see liquidity needs or the liquidity surplus of other banks uh, in the system. So as when that collapsed, so banks are not able to transact with each other in that uh, foreign exchange interbank market. So they were just pricing based on their own client books and their own client needs. Yeah. Chaji, are you saying that the central bank was unable to manage the functions of banks? Because it's a function of the central bank. The central bank is also the bank for bankers. So given these roles, among the other many other roles they have, are we saying that what we then witnessed was a collapse in the central bank's ability to manage the FX market? Is that what you're saying? In a way, you can say that, but also there are a number of regulations which came in 2015, which now also impose some controls within the context of FX uh, foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, you are not able to uh, do this uh, in terms of FX or your holdings needs to be a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. So with that, I mean, it now eroded the confidence uh, for the FX interbank market. So in a way, I agree with you that uh, the central bank didn't come in and uh, stem its authority at least to be able to see a revival of the fx interbank market mm. but having said that we saw uh, sometime last month whereby it put up the fx code uh, this is something that a number of uh, central bankers across the globe they have been adopting this fx code so this is something that helps operationalize uh, issues such as the FX interbank market. And once that one was put out in the market, so already, uh, even amongst the bankers, they knew the kind of the rules of the game mm. as they come back to the FX interbank market. Right. That has always, sorry, sorry, Wanjiru, go ahead. Just a question. Um, they're back into the FX exchange market. You say there's a code which sounds a bit like FX um, code, yeah. Yeah, maybe some guidelines. Exactly, yeah. Uh, some standards, guidelines. Yeah. Are we sure? And then we're also seeing that the government is trying to to borrow. You know, try to float a bond was not able to was undersubscribed, <coughs> which continues to impinge on the uh, liquidity, um, the fiscal space of the government. Are we likely to see in another two, three months another crunch coming and the market collapsing again because of the government's own pressures, fiscal pressures? Because a lot of this pressure is due to government borrowing and debt repayments. That is where the pressure is 
is coming from. So are we out of the woods? Is this going to be sustained or is it just a temporary reprieve? And then as government seeks to borrow more because they're likely to come back heavily into the domestic market, um, are we likely to see this, this situation unravel again? Okay, well, that's quite a heavy question. Uh, so let me try and unpack it here. So for sure, we've seen pressure uh, on the FX reserves. At some point, we're at around 10, 10 uh, billion dollars at some point. Uh, but I think that was after some Eurobond issuance. Uh, but it, now, it has now come to around 6.5 billion dollars right now, as at the end of last week. So definitely there's a pressure. And if you look at the import cover, uh, we're looking at uh, months of import cover, this 6.5 billion dollars. And if you compare with the import needs, uh, it has really come below the stat statutory level, below the four months of import cover. So definitely there's been a pressure on, on that here. Uh, you mentioned things around uh, debt repayments. Uh, external debt repayments uh, are significant, but not as significant as what we are seeing on uh, domestic debt repayment. So the, the, the intention or what we are seeing, which is not sustainable, is the fact that our FX reserves predominantly is not from our exports. Uh, it's predominantly from uh, inflows from borrowing, mm. be it on the multilateral uh, level, be it on the syndicated loans, or be it on the euro bonds. So those are the things that are uh, ramp up our FX reserves, but it's not sustainable because it's in, it's money in money out debt repayment so it's not quite sustainable uh what efforts have we seen also in addition to that we remember that right now we have the government to government oil importation deal i still have reservations on that in the sense that uh, uh the intention is at least to reduce pressure on fx reserves by 500 million dollars on a monthly basis but we'll see how it has been drafted it's just for six months so yes uh starting from this month we will not see a decline in fx reserves f to the tune of 500 million dollars because of the fact that uh the oil market import oil market companies are now paying right now in kenya shillings but one of the one of their players but these monies will be paid ultimately we need to convert this money Kenya shillings terms mm. into dollars like six months down the line. So six months down the line is where, when we can now start seeing pressure on FX reserves. So that is not sustainable. Uh, yes, we may get some reprieve a couple of months just to, to breathe a bit. Uh, potentially to build up our reserves, we still expect some money is coming in, $1 billion from the World Bank. Uh, there's some money from IMFs coming in. So at least our FX reserves will be built, but still, uh, I think the pressure will start coming in uh, six months down the line. So the current situation that is being faced, if you're saying the pressure will come six months down the line, how would you describe the current situation? And all of these things are happening simultaneously, right? We talk about low reserves. We talk about having to pay debt. We talk about having to borrow in order to sustain an economy which is already in the doldrums. And then we're looking at 50 billion shillings every week of money that has to be paid. This is a story that has made its way into the headlines this morning and talks about all of the loans somehow maturing to the tune of 50 billion every week. It seems to me that not six months down the line, but today <laughs> that mm. there is um, an issue that obviously compounds an already bad problem so if we're saying it's going to get worse because all of these things don't happen in isolation of the other low foreign uh, forex reserves at the same time a huge debt burden wanting to borrow more and increasing that burden and the economy also doing rather poorly and look at all the factors that we're talking about revenue collection is down much lower than what they expected to be and uh, talking about performance below 90% of the KRA and, you know, etc. If there were to be inroads as to how we can be, how Kenya would be able to start to chip away at this problem, because they say a debt paid regularly is less of a debt, right? But it seems that even as those debts are being paid, more are being taken, still trying to balance things here and there. What then ought to happen at this point 
for Kenya then to be able to balance things and not go into default, not be able to pay its counties, not have to borrow more? Oh, um, the situation definitely is quite dire. So I think uh, I'd spoken just on the external side of things. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the bigger picture, which you're trying to put, put, uh, to bring out, uh, the fiscal is not in the best of shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at uh, the numbers you've seen uh, for the revenues uh, for the first nine months of the current financial year from July all the way to March. Uh, leaves a lot to be desired because our... Uh, if you look at that numbers that were, there are two numbers that are out there. Mm. If you look at the numbers that were put on the Kenya Gazette, that's the exchequer revenue, mm. uh, what we call the ordinary revenue. Yeah. As at the end of March, I think we had collected 1.39 trillion. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the carry numbers, uh, for carry numbers, they have, uh, they, 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 they have what we call appropriation in aid mm. these are things like mm. import declaration fees the other levies which they collect on behalf of the government but they don't necessarily pass it to the exchequer so that's where the divergence is i think that number was at around 1.45 trillion from the carrier side okay. so that now speaks to the 92.5 percent performance by i think 95 percent performance by carrier but if you look at it from the exchequer side uh which that is the number that matters to me. I think we are doing poorly. I mean, that's the stack. So 1.39 trillion. Yeah, 1.39 trillion. For the yeah. first nine months of the financial year. Exactly. Yeah. What should it have been? Uh, if you prorate it, uh, it should have been 1.58 trillion shillings here. Yeah. But definitely, the what usually happens is that there are now there are number of months which have higher tax revenue collection mm. and in this current quarter we are talking about months of april and months of june mm. so if you look at that 1.39 trillion that was collected and if you do like the average in the first nine months that number is coming to 154 billion shillings on average so if you assume that 154 billion mm. will be the collection for the month of may because it's the it's 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 more and it's a more of a normal month yeah mm -hmm. And then you look at what needs to be collected between the months of April and June. Yep. You're talking about 280 billion. That's a staggering number, considering that the highest monthly collection we have ever collected is around 201 billion. So, can I ask you, sorry, just to clarify something? So, if you're saying 280 billion, and this 50 billion that we're talking about that needs to be paid in terms of loans, seems a simple question but does the money then that needs to be paid in terms of loan does it primarily come from these collections uh debt servicing you can look at it in two ways yeah uh one part of that is now interest service so we have the loans we have the euro bonds and we have to pay coupons yeah. on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis yeah so that's the interest component mm -hmm. in the current financial year we're looking at 675 billion that is the amount of total interest that we need to pay a significant chunk of that 80 percent of that is now for domestic borrowing mm. and then the other is now for the external borrowing the other chunk of the debt repayment is now the debt that are maturing mm -hmm. the bonds that are maturing the mm. loans that are coming to an end so we need now to pay them off so those ones are either you refinance your you roll over them and that uh, now brings to the other point uh, the euro bond uh, mm -hmm. just to bring this issue we have a uh, two billion dollar that is maturing next june mm -hmm. so obviously if you look at it from the context of uh, uh, external debt repayment mm -hmm. for next year, we're yeah. looking at something close to 700 billion, of which 470 is now to repay all the loans that mm -hmm. will mature, and then the other balance will now to service the loans that are still existing. Okay. So that is the yeah. bigger so, problem. So obviously the crunch has come. Now this is not a surprise because these loans were taken; they were on the books. The, um, in fact the Okwa Uchumi coalition, you know, one of the things that they ha had highlighted is one, this government was elected on a, or campaigned on a platform of economic de uh, democratization and inclusion. They correctly identified the economic uh, situation, the fiscal crunch that we were in, the debt repayments. They talked about a Marshall Plan. 
um, you now they said this politically a Marshall Plan being an economic recovery that helps us deal with debt and helps us you know but things seem to have gone badly wrong we are not seeing any evidence that they look very unprepared they look surprised by everything. They're not able to pay public service salaries. You know, the civil service being unpaid is something that we are not used to hearing. Uh, we've seen the allocations to counties uh, plateau, uh, which means if you're not increasing uh, the allocation to counties, you are actually decreasing the allocation to counties. Um, I, you know, so this in your view um, and you know as as the okwa uchumi coalition one of the problems we had identified is that kenya has an expenditure problem in that where money is put is not giving returns has this government in their planning are they dealing with the expenditure side and are they also dealing with the debt management side properly because Th this was going to happen. Mm. They were going to have to make decisions. This money has to be paid. It seems we've lost confidence. Um, investors no longer want to put money in the long-term bonds. Mm. So we are forced back into short-term expensive borrowing. Syndicated loans are the most expensive. Um, so is government doing the right things to tame the debt problem? Um, and how did the budget manage to, to grow? Because our budget actually, the, the numbers grew. You know, are we on the right track or is, or is this thing looking like one big mess? You know, are we, are we seeing a skunk? Because yes, it doesn't smell very good around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, in matters, diagnosis, Kenya Kwanzaa government was quite spot on. Uh, but I think it's been uh, disappointing because I remember they had uh, even uh, differentiated in terms of uh, timelines of achieving some of these things. Uh, they had this short term goals medium term goals the medium term goals and long term goals and uh, just to highlight one of the issues within the context of the fiscals was uh, things to do with the settlement of pending bills, which they had highlighted as a key priority, which mm. should be done within the uh, short term horizon. Yeah, we haven't seen much traction happening with that. Uh, actually, what you are saying is that that uh, pending bill problem has been compounded. We just had. Uh, <coughs> The cabinet secretary for roads just uh, uh, amplifying how pending bills has been a thorny issue within his ministry. Mm. So that's, uh, I mean, we haven't seen the implementation phase has been uh, wanting by the new government here. But uh, fair enough, we can say that uh, they came in, it was, we all knew that the next government coming in after the previous government was going to have a trough yeah. so that's not that wasn't a surprise and i think they are trying to muddle through uh amidst all 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 the things that are happening here uh what we know from the um a manifesto is issues such as uh, we call the expenditure rule in the context that uh going forward the revenues uh, for the amount of revenues in their projections will be m looking at the average of the last three years, something like that, mm. and then they say, okay, if revenue grew by, say, 4% in the last f three years, so they say, okay, so that will be the growth rate getting into the next financial year. Mm. And then the expenditure on the other side is capped at around 75% of the revenue growth. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at revenue growing by 4%, expenditure 75% of that, so you're looking at 3% expenditure growth. But if you look at the numbers, uh, whoa, whooping, because you're looking at a scenario whereby right now our ordinary revenue is around 2.17 trillion. The next number is a uh, increase of 400 billion so definitely that four percent growth is not there mm. and also we've had the top echelons of the current government saying that oh, we want to increase our tax revenue by another one trillion where will it come from if looking at the numbers so far in the current financial year we've not been able to achieve our targets so that is a major disconnect is it a day is it is it are they deviating from what they had promised during the campaigns definitely because what you're saying is they're saying we will be looking at that and just projecting a four percent growth in revenues 
one trillion is the projected growth is that four percent actually what, what it sounds <laughs> like mm. is that the presidential advisor david d giving this idea of fiscal rules yeah. and I, I i don't know where, where yeah. professor jogona is on this is a very prudent kind of thinking saying well this is how we are going to manage our budgeting and then there's the political <coughs> side where the budget actually gets made yeah and that's all about political promises and this is a very yeah. indisciplined government let's take a break when so we come far. back we look at uh <laughs> so what what needs to happen what are the what are the options of the kenya Kwanzaa administration with the current situation as you've painted this is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Churchill Ogutu from IG Group talking about the debt crisis and the options that Kenya Kwanza has for recovery. So let's just get straight into that then, Churchill, right? You've painted the picture, the things and the way they look like and how much, for example, in the next financial year you need to raise just to pay debt. I said 700 billion. Yeah. In, um uh, is it, it in the next calendar year or in the next financial year? In the next financial year. At least the external debt. Why? Uh, yeah. That's the ex external, external debt of 700 debt, yeah. billion. Yeah. And if you look at now, including the, the domestic? interest, domestic, we're looking at over 1 trillion. <laughs> okay. Both interest and, and debt repayment. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, revenue targets of 2. what trillion? Uh, we're looking at 2.5 trillion ordinary revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Why? In a 3.6 trillion shilling budget, when about a third of it is basically going to pay debt. Something like that. What are the options? How does the government get there? Oh, it's, it's quite a dire situation, definitely. Mm. So, there are a number of options that they can do. Uh, one is now to scale uh, the spending where possible. I mean, there's much you can be able to scale back. Uh, oh, scale back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can scale up. Eh? Okay. Yeah. 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 Scale spending. Yeah, you can uh -huh. reduce. You can reduce the spending. Basically, that's what I want to say. Uh, hmm. Obviously, there are things such as uh, wage bill. Uh, just see options or areas whereby you can be able to reduce. Uh, it's lower. I mean, we're looking at close to six hundred billion, which is not the wage bill. A uh, significant chunk of that you find is now what are they uh, marupurupu or hmm. is the name uh, what are they called? Um, this extra over and above uh, the salary payment that you receive mm, so allowances if, uh, yeah those allowances yeah that's <laughs> what I wanted to that's the word I wanted to to, to, to yeah. get here mm. so and then uh, there are things like operations and maintenance uh, find areas of how much is our operations and maintenance uh, then figure I don't have it uh, top of my head by looking at a uh, number obviously it's below 600 billion shillings yeah so it's over 300 billion yeah give or takes a Annual. number like that yeah at every least, year uh, and what is operations and maintenance uh things like uh say you printing salary uh, flowers. not salary flowers those things mandas <laughs> exactly so Busa, fixing, fixing things uh, yeah you know, keeping, keeping the things running, running. Buildings, keeping yeah, facilities yeah. running so oh, that yeah. means yeah. electricity yeah. Water, water. In fact, traditionally, v by the way, the, 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 the maintenance mm. of of facilities has tended to suffer, and maybe the things that do do get spent are not that important. So even when you say operations and maintenance, you have to be clear on which, yep. because you don't want run down buildings um, when you're buying mandazis and flowers and people are traveling all over the place. So Wajiro, you know, if you just think about over 400 billion shillings going into operations and maintenance, is that really like refurbishing our offices and making sure that the critical vehicles are fueled and keeping the lights on and so furniture is in good repair? Yeah. yeah. Well, some is of it is in furniture. What I'm saying here is the devil is in the detail. Yeah. Because even when you say reduce government spending by slashing um, salaries, which salaries do you want to cut really? Mm. I mean, if you want to get good health care, you need to pay your doctors properly so who who you know wh who bites the bullet when you're when you're hiring 50 CASs and having these kind of spurious amounts and much as they are maybe not big draws on the budget what are the principles you're using to to reduce spending what this government is doing contrary to its election promise to do bottom-up is they are seeking to privatize things Hmm. Now, when you privatize, that means you're cutting um, tertiary allocation to tertiary institutions. Granted, universities have misspent their money, so there's a mismanagement problem. But the fact of it is that 
majority of Kenyan students are able to go through university because the government made it affordable. So the moment you say you're privatizing um, and it's on, based on ability to pay, and then you want help to be allocated to only the needy students, which isn't bad in principle, but you're saying, which mechanism are you using? So there are, this government is opting out of putting money in service delivery, yet they're expanding the budget because the, the budget did grow. And like you, uh, um, you've told us, it grew beyond the fiscal rule, uh, you know, are, it's an expansionary budget. Um, but who, where are they cutting? So they must not cut on essential services. Okay. They must not cut on those parts <coughs> of the budget that w have a multiplier effect. Okay. So for instance, if you Buying cut money car. to agriculture, mm. which is a county function, what are you saying? And, and so where are you putting the money? So I think we are back to the problem we've had over the last 10 years with the Jubilee administration, where it was the wrong priorities. So we have a repeat performance. <laughs> yes, but on a, at a time when we don't have the fiscal space. But so that's why we're asking Churchill, what are the options? What are the then? options? Because yeah, this is where it's going to be 600 billion shillings is going to pay salaries and allowances. Uh, about 400 billion shillings or thereabouts is doing the operations and maintenance. That's a trillion. There's a trillion shillings that's going to uh, repay domestic and foreign debt. I just need to understand before you continue, Eric. Uh, when you pay this trillion, we've paid everything, meaning uh, because their interests. Those are the ones now. We, they, they, now we've they paid interest plus yeah, everything. Mm. No, we've paid interest and also the loans that are maturing. Those ones that are maturing. That, uh, within, within that period of time. Exactly, yeah. 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 And, what, so, sorry, and what will be pending? More, more debt. Still more more debt. debt. But the following year. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Plans take more money. This is the thing. Right That's now we're at 9.1 trillion shillings. Yeah. We expect uh, by the end of this financial year, we'll be at around 9.5, 9.6 trillion. Remember that uh, the estimate was at 9.4 trillion. But because of the fact that our currency has depreciated uh, f faster than it was expected. And we borrowed, our borrowing was based on the dollar. Some of the borrowings are in dollars. Mm. Like even this, uh, the, the monies that we still expect from the World Bank IMF Dollar. is in dollars. But if you convert it in Kenya shillings at the current exchange rate, it balloons the public debt. Yeah. So you're looking at, it was initially expected that it will be at 9.4 trillion, but it could possibly hit 9.6 trillion by the end of June uh, once all this money comes in. And... Uh, the next financial year, the expectation is that we'll borrow another, the net borrowing. This is now after repaying the debt and then some, uh, some new, the net Churchill, borrowing. Th what you say makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Let, let me just ask this question. Huh? This money that we are paying for, this government didn't borrow. It was money which was borrowed before this government came in. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, from what I've heard from Wanjiro, yourself and other experts, when we borrow, we actually know when we are supposed to start paying. We know. Yes. It's in, yes. we, even, even the so day that then, we know. We know, okay. definitely. Walk us through the process that is laid down to ensure that when they fall due, we actually have money to pay. Because we are behaving as though this money has come due and we, are, we have been caught unawares. Mm. <laughs> and now we are not paying salaries because we need to pay debts. We, we are now doing this because we need to do this. See, you haven't been listening. If you recall when we hosted uh, Dr. Jaramba here sometime last year, um, uh, through the Okwa Uchumi conversation. How long ago was that? <laughs> well, it might <laughs> even be a year and a half. Yeah, mm. so, and I'm supposed to remember what was said a year and a half. Let me remind you. Yeah. 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 I know, I know <laughs> you. Is it City who <laughs> remember <laughs> what she said? Huh? I, 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 take, I take your point. <laughs> Let me remind you. Yeah. He said, government is operating like it's running a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> And it, it, it borrows to pay borrows from one place to pay the other and it's in we're in this cycle. So we're in a debt cycle. We've been in a debt cycle for a long time because we keep budgeting for more money than we have. So we that have a what, deficit. That what they call debt financing. Uh, 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 we a debt financed yeah. budget. Yes. And then we 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 budget for more than we have. Mm. We budget for more than we can collect. So we overestimate the revenue to a point where it's possible that 
even these revenue projections, the level of taxation actually frustrates the collection. And people have been saying, why don't you ease the tax and let businesses operate? Because if you overtax uh, businesses, yes, you actually down. kill the business environment. So this, the, it's a repeat. We are seeing, unfortunately, a repeat of the missteps that the Jubilee administration uh, did. And maybe, to be fair, to give you t space to answer the question, what are the options? Are we heading the Ghana way? Are we heading some other, the Greece way? Or is, this, is there a recovery? Uh, the government, uh, Professor Joguna CS has said three years to kind of stabilize things. Do we look like we are stabilizing? If you are seated in that seat, what would you do so that we can continue some l support to services, mm. which is essential. Business operation is essential because you don't want to grind business to a halt. What would you do? Okay, and now let's allow Churchill to yeah. give us that <laughs> way forward. Yeah. Now, yeah. now we'll not interrupt you. No, we Go. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, yeah. So, uh, definitely, uh, it's a tight balancing act. And even as we looked at what areas needs to be scaled down, definitely, it's a, it's a tough not to crack uh because you there are some trade-offs that needs to happen and definitely you don't want to impact negatively uh because as we looked at if you reduce salary or if you chase away some of the public servants uh there's some ripple neg negative ripple effect even to the economy because of uh reduced uh consumption so to answer uh city's question is, did they know or did they not know that will be uh, this is they had they had already picked the debt but did they know or had they estimated how to service the debt but remember uh, just to put it this way some of the debt that you have uh, if you look at the split between domestic and external it's like a 50 50 split 50 percent split each uh, so for instance this euro bond that is maturing next year uh, we took it in 2014 so it was a 10-year euro bond mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a, it was $2 billion. Uh, at that point, the exchange rate was at 87.5. <coughs> it's 7.5 shillings on the dollar. So that was around 170 billion thereabout. But right now, where is our exchange rate? We're looking at 135. So between that, the time we took the, uh, the euro bond and up until right now, you're looking at a massive depreciation on the, on the, on the, on the Kenya shilling. Mm. So assuming that they were still, uh, they had pegged the dollar Kenya shilling exchange rate to be where it is. And this is the debt servicing that they had potentially extrapolated that they'll keep on paying for the next 10 years. Definitely, because of the adverse negative exchange rate, they have been hit. But it's not that they don't keep on changing. They do keep revising uh, the debt servicing costs on a yearly basis. At the time that the budget uh, process kicks in, they also have their estimates as to where the uh, the debt servicing costs will be in, a, in any given year. So it's just a matter of hoping that uh, exchange rate uh, doesn't adversely affect their debt servicing cost when it is due. Okay. And also there are a number of uh, issues, external factors that also come to, to tow. And that now brings... Uh, Share into the picture, like we are just one external crisis away from a complete disaster, the Ghana and Zambia case. We are just right there looking at uh, um, within the capital market space. The government announces intention of, uh, which is a proactive way of trying to reduce the risk of this upcoming maturity. Remember I started by mentioning that we have low reserves, uh, our import, if you look at the, our FX reserves, as compared to our import needs, it's below the statutory level. So assuming that we don't have monies to pay off this $2 billion, which is around 270 billion shillings at the current rate, what that means is that the government will now be forced to get the monies out of its FX reserves. Uh, so assuming that $2 billion is from FX reserves, so it will further lower the FX reserves and further exacerbate pressure on uh, exchange rate and all those things so the government came in and uh, already it had in 
made the intention within the budget policy statement within the medium term debt management strategy that it wants to find a way of at least uh, refinancing this uh, euro bond so the euro bond right now it was trading at around 13 percent so that is if anyone wants to buy that euro bond that is the return that you can get 13 percent but b after that announcement which came out last week we are looking at the yield right now is uh, at around 19 percent so that means that uh, if the yield is higher it means that the bond euro bond has lost value mm -hmm. and that is a way of investors foreign investors telling us that they are still having some concerns as to the entire fiscal picture that kenya is in right now mm -hmm. so that tells us that if there's another say covid 19 or there's another country invading another country will be completely done because we'll not be able to refinance this our coffers are our external buffers are quite low and looking at what is happening uh domestic revenue we're not able to meet it up we have this unmet expenditure so it just exacerbates the issue sorry i'm the bearer of bad news but uh no no, no, no it's, 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 the, it's the situation of what really is happening in the country so this is the thing if it is clear from those who are outside of government all right then it must be clear for those who are the practitioners of all of this, the fiscal space itself. We hope. Well, it's, it's, you're in the middle of it every day. We're told three years is when we hope that all of this will stabilize and all of these things happening. What would be the hope in terms of measures to be put in place? Because it is not a healthy situation whereby you say, let me pay my debt and these other things that will actually be the runners of the economy then be put on hold that's also a very dangerous place to be in whereby anything that you have is being mopped up to use to pay debt there's impending debt there's still plans to loan uh, to borrow money but then you cannot keep the country running essentially that's where we are today what would be the thing that ought to be done because there seem to be so many external factors at play here for an internal issue but it cannot be that Kenya is one disaster away from total downfall. I mean, mm. uh, no, that is no, the no. case. I'm saying it cannot be, if I can finish, that that is what it is and that nobody is doing a thing about it but mm. waiting for it to happen. Or encouraging it to happen. I think the problem um. is political. So why, why would you see things implode and not do anything about it is my is my. Or what yeah, would be yeah. the because you see something is hurting you fix it what's holding them hostage yeah in your opinion yeah the number of uh, st state actors as uh, shiro has alluded to remember that uh, if you look at the budget process uh, that's where what has brought us in to where we are right now at uh, the number of players we have parliament we have um, the budget and appropriation committee right now we also have a uh, public debt and private privatization committee mm. so there are a number of players that needs mm. to play an oversight role but definitely they've dropped the ball so they need now to come in together uh obviously there are a number of uh bickering between the two main political divides but they need to come in unison uh that okay this is for the sake of our country i mean mm -hmm. you just have one country so that they can just work together at least to ensure that that oversight bit is adequately uh handled yeah. uh properly so that's the other thing that we need to see and in the context of internal solutions uh privatization uh definitely shiro had his had her own views towards that but we are still keeping an eye to see what how this privatization plan will be definitely there is some hue and cry from different sectors of how the privatization will be handled yeah. so that is a big key issue that we if need. handled well would it be uh, contributing to solution mm. absolutely are you talking about kenya's situation or some other country kenya. Kenya. So kenya no powers. the bill proposes to bypass parliament okay in yeah. so yeah, where that, does that, your uh, if come from okay yeah which parliament even if it went through this parliament <laughs> <Yeah. zero. laughs> yes so at if, least we'll be at 70 percent but now well. they're saying forget <laughs> about parliament yeah. forget about the problem is political 
the problem is about accountability. When you know, we are, we, are play, we, are, we are playing at let's pretend. So if we were accountable, if we did the right thing, yes. if our police... Hey, yeah. 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 We have yes. to end. <laughs> <laughs> If Churchill left the show, <laughs> would things change? <laughs> Churchill, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Churchill Bob. Ogutu is an economist. He's from the IG Group. We've been talking about the debt crisis and the options for the Kenya Kwanzaa administration. Keep it here for more conversations coming up in the next hour. When Jiroge Konyo is our guest host today, she stays on until 10. Churchill leaves and another guest comes in.